everyone. Um, the aim of this lecture is to provide some more intuition and background on transformer language models. Um, after that, um, for next class, then we'll talk a little bit about vision transformers, audio transformers. And then when we come back in the course to applications, we'll talk a lot about applications um, that you can do um, with uh, language transformer models. All right. Um, okay, um, so first I want to try to get a little bit more intuition um, for what a transformer attends to. So remember that the key ingredient of the transformer is attention, um, self-attention within a sequence. Um, and there is a literature that seeks to understand the inner workings of transformer-based language models um, by looking um, at the attention maps. Um, and so in particular, there's a paper by, um, uh, by Manning, who's a pioneer of NLP um, and his collaborators, um, that looks at what a pre-trained BERT model attends to. Um, so they're not looking at a version of BERT that's been fine-tuned on any downstream task. So this hasn't been fine-tuned for named entity recognition or sentiment analysis or classification. It's just the pre-trained BERT. Um, and so the model has only seen self-supervised training. It hasn't seen any um, supervised training at all. Um, and the bottom line is that BERT's attention heads attend to linguistic phenomena very well, despite not being trained on them. And I think this was, you know, potentially quite surprising to uh, linguists, computational linguistics um, people who had come at NLP for a long time via human engineered rules that you have this model and you're just training it to predict mass tokens and yet it it, it learns to attend to all these linguistic phenomena uh, that are important to understanding language. Um, and so this is uh, one of the visualizations from the paper. Um, remember at each layer of the transformer there's multiple attention heads so Head 1-1 one, one attends broadly, um, and the third layer, the first head attends to the next token, and the eighth layer, the seventh head attends to the separator token, and the eleventh layer, uh, the sixth head attends to uh, periods, for instance, um, and they give lots more examples. Um, you have direct objects attending to their verbs. Um, if you wanted it to um, detect direct objects, it would have 86.8% accuracy. Um, nouns attending to their modifiers, um, uh, possessive pronouns and apostrophes attend to the head of the corresponding uh, noun. Um, and so again, you'd have very high accuracy or at least sort of high accuracy if um, you use this uh, attention head directly. Um, passive auxiliary verbs attend to the verb that they uh, modify prepositions attend to their objects. Um, and so as you can see, there's just, I mean, there's lots and lots of these heads with multiple heads in each layer, and they seem to be learning to attend to different uh, linguistic phenomena that, that are important to understanding language, um, which is um, pretty amazing. All right. Um, and so the attention maps look reasonable. You know, when we get to vision transformers, uh, for example, we'll also see visualization of the attention maps. And again, you know, see that as, I mean, it makes sense given that it's able to really accurately perform on lots of downstream tasks. But with this, you know, this self-supervised pre-training, it really learns to attend to very reasonable things. Okay, second uh, topic, what's in an embedding? Um, so, Traditionally, people have tried to understand what's in an embedding by using uh, what are called probing classifiers that try to predict certain things about words using just their pre-trained embeddings. So like the part of speech or the tense or the gender um, or word sense. Um, there's a somewhat recent survey paper that aggregates the finding of many different probing classifier studies of BERT, and there's a bunch of them. And the, the bottom line is that bird embeddings contain information on a lot of stuff. Um, so if bird embeddings can produce a coherent classifier, they provide information on that feature. Um, and so in some sense, this, is, this, is, this makes a lot of sense. We talked about how you can take these pre-trained bird embeddings and then with a relatively small amount of labeled data, fine tune them for all sorts of downstream tasks. Um, and so in some sense, you know, they have to contain a lot of information for that to be 
um, realistic. Um, but at the same time, I do think that this means that you have to be really cautious um, in interpreting these embeddings in like a reduced form way. So I've had students, for example, ask me, well, if embeddings of the speech of Democrats and Republicans move further apart, does that mean that politics is becoming more polarized? And no, that's not necessarily true. You know, if you have shifts in where Democrats and Republicans are from and there's different speech patterns in that place, those places, right, that could drive the phenomena, etc. So I think that just kind of in general, you have to understand that in a pre-trained embedding, there, you know, again, these pre-trained embeddings, they're 768 dimensional vectors. Um, on they're the representations that come out of passing the text through through a, a transformer language model, and they have a lot of information about a lot of different things pertaining to the text in them. And so um, that's amazing because then we can tune them to specifically do lots of tasks downstream. Um, but at the same time, if you just want to use the straight up pre-trained embeddings that come out of BERT without kind of further tuning, uh, y you have to be really cautious in interpreting reduced form patterns because there is just a lot of information in these embeddings. All right. Um, you can also probe what's contained in hidden representation from different layers of BERT, um, which remember it's stacking a bunch of different transformer blocks. Uh, representations of the same word in different contexts tend to move apart deeper into the network, suggesting that upper layers provide more context-specific representations. And again, this is what we would expect, right? Because at each layer, it has the opportunity to flexibly attend to every other token in the context. So it makes sense that as it passes through multiple layers, uh, that the representations get more and more contextualized, uh, meaning that it's the same word, uh, but if they're used in different contexts, their representations are different. Okay, what happens to bird embeddings during fine tuning? Uh, people have also looked at this. Um, and what they found is that fine tuning mostly alters the top few layers. Um, and also that fine tuning has a significant effect on in-domain sentences. So sentences that are in the same domain as what it was fine tuned on, but out of domain sentences remain much closer to the original representations. Um, and again, this makes a lot of um, sense and sort of serves as a sanity check. Um, you know, so if you fine tune it on um, 20th century articles about sports, um, and then you want to get embeddings of Shakespeare, like that fine tuning, um, hopefully does not have much of an impact. Um, you know, there has been some literature about a phenomenon called catastrophic forgetting, um, where if you fine tune something on a very narrow domain, could the model forget uh, this general purpose knowledge that it had? And like, you know, that, that can happen. Um, but it seems like in, in general, which is a good property, um, that fine tuning is mostly affecting things that are in domain. All right, um, visualizing embeddings. Um, embeddings are dense objects. Um, as I mentioned with um, BERT base, they're 768 dimensions. That's also going to be true with Roberto base. 768 dimensions is very common if you're using a large model. Um, BERT large, there are 1024 dimensions. Um, and there are two main approaches to visualizing an embedding. Um, you know, obviously we can't visualize a vector in 768 or 1024 dimensional space. We can reduce the dimensions down to two or three dimensions and visualize them. Or um, we can um, use a classifier or some other function to extract relevant information and then visualize that. Um, the second approach being more structured um, I'd say that the first approach is kind of most common, um, but the second approach is also something uh, good to be aware of. Okay, so if we're just going to do kind of a reduced form dimensionality reduction, uh, there's three main approaches. There's PCA, uh, don't use that. Nobody uses that to visualize um, these embeddings, so just kind of take that off the table, not the right tool for the job. Uh, TSNE. Um, and UMAP, which is uh, what you'll want to use in practice. You know, some older papers, you'll see them use TSNE, but like um, UMAP is really um, the, uh, the, the 
uh, current tool for this job and is used uh, quite frequently. Um, all right, so what PCA does is define the orthogonal axes that maximize the variance of the data and then projects the data onto those axes. And the first principal component is the direction of the greatest variance in the data. Um, it's not optimized for preser preserving the local or global structure of a set of high dimensional data points, which is what we have here. And so it's really not something that you want to use, even though kind of in economics we see it used a lot, but that's you know, not for 768 dimensional vectors. You really don't want to use it in this context. Um, Tisney uh, creates probability distributions over neighboring points in a high dimensional space uh, for which high probabilities correspond to closer points in the space and then tries to recreate the distributions for these points in a much lower space, so say in a two dimensional space. Um, this is good at preserving local structure, but not global structures. Um, so it can separate out distinct clusters in the data but the distances between those clusters aren't very meaningful. Um, and this is just um, you know, giving a, a, a visual example. And you can see that TSNE does a relatively good job of preserving um, those local structures. Um, in practice, uh, what people use is UMAP. Um, I won't talk in detail about what it is doing um, as it's somewhat involved. Um, but basically, in a nutshell, the method creates a manifold in high dimensional space that has good properties, and it creates a similar manifold in low dimensional space, and then maximizes their similarity using a cross entropy loss. Um, it preserves local structure well, which we want, and it does better with the global structure than TSNE. I mean, obviously, when you're taking things from 768 dimensions down to three dimensions, um, you're losing a lot of information and there's no guarantee that kind of what you want to see will be preserved. Um, but it tends to, to work reasonably well. Um, you know, for example, we've done a lot of visualizations with U UMAP on, um, for instance, um, article topics. Um, and it's, it's not perfect, um, but I think it is helpful and it is a useful way um, to explore the data. Um, the other thing that you see done sometimes is probing classifiers. Um, and so there's something known as the Hewitt and Manning methodology. And essentially they estimate a matrix that can push bird embeddings into a lower dimensional space where the distance between the projected embeddings corresponds to the distance between words in a syntax tree. Um, and you know, that's not necessarily kind of something that we would want to do. Um, but you can also do this with other objectives. Um, so I've seen it done with word sense disambiguation. Um, and you can change the size of the matrices to successively squeeze the embeddings into lower and lower dimensions. And so this is kind of interesting if you want a more structured way to think about um, visualizing embeddings. All right. Um, and finally, I want to say a few words about language modeling for historical and very recent contexts. And you'll see, you know, these are actually related in terms of the challenges they pose. Um, you know, so I know a lot of people in this class are interested in historical applications. So what kind of challenges might you run into if you take um, Roberta, uh, which was trained, you know, on Wikipedia and, uh, and the internet, basically the public domain internet, common crawl, um, and so mostly stuff from say 2019, um, and you take that and you try to apply it um, to data from the 17th century. Uh, well, the first issue is that the large language models tokenization procedure is not optimized for the distribution of words seen in historical texts. And let me, let me say a word on this because this is kind of an important thing to, to understand. Um, and so remember kind of the first step um, before you can pass text um, to um, to the transformer model is you have to tokenize that text. So you need a vector representation for each word in the text. But when we say each word in the text, it doesn't literally mean each word um, because um, we have a, a limit to um, how many things that, that we can predict over with a softmax, right? So when we're predicting out that like the tokens that have been masked, we really can't have our vocabulary be larger than like 100,000 words or it just becomes computationally infeasible to compute that softmax loss because the denominator is over everything. Um, and um, 
And so kind of what the tokenizer will do is for a given word, first of all, it will see if that word is in the token a dictionary. And if it is, then that word gets tokenized. That word is what has a vector representation and certainly kind of all the common words will be tokenized as a word. Um, but then if that word is um, not in the tokenizer, which for example, for like proper nouns, it, it won't be, um, then that's split into subwords and it sees if those subwords are in there. Um, and you know, down on in the tokenizer list, you'll see lists of like individual characters. Um, and so characters used in kind of very odd combinations, um, like the combinations of those characters won't even be um, in, in the tokenizer. And so it could be, um, you know, it could tokenize individual characters. So basically it's breaking, you know, if the, the word itself is too uncommon to be in the tokenizer, then it'll break it up and further break it up until it's able to tokenize um, it potentially kind of at the extreme into to characters. And so um, if people use words historically that aren't used at present, um, or they spell words differently, um, which is kind of the second point, um, then that text is going to get tokenized differently than modern text. And kind of at the extreme, it might end up with lots and lots of these kind of subword tokens that we're seeing very rarely um, in the pre-training um, because there's just weird combinations of letters. And so it's, in, it's ending up with these tokens that be, you know, consisting of these tokens that the model didn't see a lot in pre-training. Um, and that can cause problems. And that can be because the language has changed because spelling has changed. It can be because of the final point. So rampant OCR errors, if you're OCRing the historical documents that you want to process, um, weird OCR errors, you know, are also going to be kind of related to this problem. You know, so you have what would be a common word, but it, the tokenizer doesn't find it because of an OCR error. And even when it splits it into subwords, it's not finding those because you have this weird OCR error that like, you know, those combination of letters are something that doesn't happen in the English language, but it does because of your OCR error. Um, other issues, changing and naming conventions. How are people referred to? Uh, this is going to be a challenge for NER, named entity recognition in particular, that people have looked at a lot. Um, and the other big thing is entity and context drift. So the sorts of places and professions and entities and events um, that the corpus is talking about change a lot over time. Um, and um, so if you're trying to do NER on historical data, um, the model has maybe just never seen those entities in pre-training, um, whereas if you're doing it on modern data, if the people are kind of relatively prominent, they're on the internet and the model has actually seen them in the pre-training. Um, and so um, all of these things can pose challenges um, there's various papers showing a performance decline on named entity recognition historically, which seems to be a task that kind of the digital humanities is particularly interested in. Uh, but this also applies to very recent contexts. You know, so there's a paper on entity disambiguation that we'll talk about when we get there. So remember, entity disambiguation is both recognizing that named entity and then figuring out if it's in Wikipedia and if so, what entity it, it is. Um, and this paper is motivated around the example of BioNTech, right, which is um, a firm that has appeared a huge amount in the news um, since uh, the start of the pandemic. Um, but um, the pre-trained language models were trained in like 2018, 2019, so it wasn't there. Um, and it's also kind of not in the benchmarks for training entity disambiguation. Um, and they find that basically it just does horrible um, on this, there, it's just a very generic name. Like there's lots of kind of obscure generic uh, biotech firms um, and the model just can't figure this out. Even though if you had a model that had been pre-trained on the internet in like 2021, it would have a super, super easy time figuring this out uh, because it's bio and tech. And even if you kind of pre-train, um, even if you fine tune on data that has bio and tech in there, it has a harder time figuring out than it would have if it had been um, in the pre-training corpus. All right. Um, and so to create a model that understands historical context, there's effectively two paths. Um, you can pre-train a language model from scratch on historical text, or you can fine tune a pre-existing model on historical text. So you might fine tune it on a specific task that you want to do, like named entity recognition, 
or you could just keep pre-training. Um, and so you could have it predict masked out tokens, um, but you're starting kind of with the pre-trained language model and you keep pre-training. Um, and the latter one is more realistic for most uses and arguably it works better. The literature has found kind of different answers on this. Um, and so this is um, a quote um, from a review article. It says, pre-trained modern embeddings pro prove to transfer reasonably well to historical text, even more when learned on very large textual data. As expected, in-domain embeddings contribute positively to performances most of the time, and the temporal proximity between the corpora from which the embeddings are derived and the targeted historical material seems to play an important role. Although a combination of generic and historical prior knowledge is likely to increase performances, what is best between very large modern models versus in-domain language models um, remains an open question. So kind of, is it better to use a model that was pre-trained on the 16th century uh, English, but is probably a really small model because nobody wants to pay, you know, nobody's willing to pay the amount of money it would cost to pre-train a very large model on 16th century English, you know, is using that kind of very targeted pre-trained model better than just using Roberta and fine-tuning it. Um, you know, so in our work with historical newspapers, we found very few instances where an off-the-shelf model, whether it's just pure off-the-shelf, you know, Roberta, you know, more realistically, that's been fine-tuned on modern data, so fine-tuned on modern newspaper articles, fine-tuned on duplicate core questions, it doesn't work great off the shelf. Sometimes it works okay, but we want really very high performance. Um, and likely, you know, the OCR errors um, and context drift are contributing to that. Uh, but we tend to get very, very good performance. So, you know, F1's ab above 90 uh, when we do relatively modest fine tuning. So we in practice haven't found it to be at all prohibitive. Um, that we have this noisy historical text and yet we're using Roberta or whatever, you know, MPNet, um, et cetera. Um, some people in digital humanities did recently pre-train a historical language model that they call McBirth um, on English from 1450 to 1950. They found some variable performance gains uh, compared to tasks, um, uh, compared to doing these tasks involving historical English um, on a, uh, large language model that was trained on contemporary data and fine tuned, but kind of even in their context, they're finding some variability there. So really like your mileage may vary and realistically, it's gonna take a lot of resources even to fine tune a quite small transformer language model on your corpus. Um, and there's a lot of evidence that you can do quite well um, by just fine tuning to your task or maybe continuing to pre-train. Um, you know, another, another paper in this regard, which was done by a group of researchers at Google, um, applies this out analysis to Twitter data. But here, instead of talking about like, you know, well, Roberta doesn't do great on Shakespeare, it's like, well, um, data trained on Twitter from the earlier 2010s, um, that, that model deteriorates substantially when it's ply applied to tweets from a few years later. So look at a relatively short period, just six years, but if you train it on data from the beginning of the period um, and look a little bit later in the period, the performance is declining a lot. Their tasks are country hashtag prediction and offensive tweet prediction. And there's benchmark data sets for these things. So granted, they're kind of idiosyncratic tasks, you know, but so is doing the stuff on the historical English. Um, and what they show is that incremental training of the original pre-trained language model, so the one trained on the earlier part of the period, um, incrementally training that on subsequent year's data um, actually achieves better performance than retraining everything uh, from scratch. And it's also much cheaper. Um, and, you know, a big kind of er huge area of research because it's of enormous commercial potential is how you constantly update these language models, right? You know, so even GPT, there's things that does, GPT chat, you know, people will talk about, well, it doesn't know these things because they happened after it was trained. Um, and so if you really want like large language models to be the bedrock of like, you know, internet search or whatever, obviously like they have to be connected to the internet and update in real time. Um, and so there's a lot of people thinking about that, um, which obviously has kind of, 
analogs to thinking about how we would get your model to update for your specific historical context as well. Um, so this is a very active area of research and I expect that we'll continue to see it being an active area of research, but I think in, in our experience, the bottom line is that you can take Roberta, fine tune it on your noisy historical data and it can still do very well. Obviously, you know, if you've gone back to like English in the 12th century, which is drastically different, that's probably not true anymore, right? So it has its limits, but I think that for a lot of historical applications that economists need to do, we don't, you know, it, 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 it works surprisingly well um, to just take the um, large language model, pre-trained non-modern data and fine tune it, but obviously you're always gonna need to have an evaluation set you're gonna to need to check that and make sure that it's doing okay in your context. Um, all right, so that's all I have uh, for now and I'll really look forward to discussing all of this more in class on Tuesday. Thank you.